Your passport shows your national identity, but your biological identity can be represented by the layers of an onion. You are in the center, and you are a member of a larger group called apes. And the apes are a member of a larger group called tetrapods. And the tetrapods are a member of a larger group called fish-like creatures. We evolved from fish-like creatures. And the fish-like creatures, they evolved from worm-like creatures. And the worm-like creatures evolved from amoeba-like creatures. And if you don't know what, much about amoebas, here's an amoeba on the lower left engulfing two slipper-like paramecia. They're, the, they're on the upper right. And it's engulfing them slowly in the uh, paramecia. Don't know what's going on. They're passive at first. And they just sit there. But then they start to realize, wait a minute, what's going on here? And then they said, let me out of here, let me out of here. But the amoeba has surrounded them, engulfed them completely, and then begins to digest them. So our ancestors a billion years ago were some very good hunters. And now it gets digested. Let's talk about you. Here you are. You are a human. You are an ape. You are a monkey. You are a primate. Now, is, we're starting to build up an onion of identity here, a phylogenetically tree-based biological passport. And I should say we're skipping lots of layers here. For example, you're not a, humans are a type of great ape, and great apes are a type of ape, and apes are a type of old world monkeys, and old world monkeys are a type of monkey. So we've skipped those two layers. But let's, if we had all the layers in there, it would be too big, too complicated, so let's skip a few. Now, so you're a primate, and primates are mammals, so you're a mammal. Tetrapod, why? Because you have four limbs, two legs and two arms. Tetrapods are a kind of fish because fish came out of the ocean and started walking around, and so tetrapods evolved from fish. Fish evolved from worms, and worms are a type of animal. Now we're getting, we're getting, <laughs> we're, we're losing space here, so we need to make animals and worms much smaller. Boop, there they are, worms, animals. You're an epistachont. Remember, epistachonts include animals and fungi. And epistachonts evolved from amoeba. Amoeba is a eukaryote, so you're a eukaryote. Eukaryotes evolved from archaea with a little help from bacteria. Archaea is part of life on Earth. And there may be a larger group called life in the universe. And then there's an even larger group called non-life. So to review this phylogenetic-based identity onion, biological passport, here you are. All the way to worms and animals and worms and animals, all the way to non-life. Now let's consider aliens. In this course, well, first of all, there's non-life in the universe. Stars and galaxies and electrons and protons and photons, non-life, lots of other stuff. Then we're as asking the question in this class, in this course, life in the universe, is there life in the universe? And the answer is, Yes, there's life in the universe because there's life on Earth. The Earth is in the universe. But what we're really interested in is, is there life in the universe that's not on Earth? Is there anything out here? And, uh, well, we're also talking about eukaryotes. And we've asked the question, are aliens eukaryotes? Would eukaryotes evolve on other planets? And when we ask that question, we're really schematically asking this. Are eukaryotes so big that they extend out into life in the universe that's not part of life on Earth? And so we have a question. Are eukaryotes out here? Now this is interesting because eukaryotes are more specific than life on Earth. And so the idea of having alien eukaryotes is much more specific, much more doubtful than having any kind of life outside the Earth. So we've got to downgrade this question mark to a smaller one because it's more likely that there's life in the universe than there is eukaryotic life in the universe. Similarly, if we ask about animals, it's more doubtful that there are alien animals than there are alien eukaryotes, which is more doubtful than any kind of life at all. And et cetera, et cetera. We can keep on going. Worms are a type of animal. It's more specific. Therefore, it's more doubtful that aliens will be a kind of worm. And then we can get arbitrarily specific and talk about 
or are aliens fish or tetrapods or mammals or monkeys or humans, etc. And that's why there's a big question mark here about those very specific things. The least, the least doubtful thing is the question, are we alone? So in some sense, the question, are we alone, is the easiest question among all these other questions. Now, let's talk about an example of this. Here we have a human being. Here are the two types of chimps. And uh, there are the hominins here. And here are the apes. So you can see that humans are a type of ape. Now, we would, what was the common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees? That common ancestor is right here. Was that common ancestor hairy? Humans are not very hairy. These guys are hairy. Which one is it? We don't know. What you can do is you can use gorillas and orangutans and these guys here, gorillas, orangutans, gibbons, and old world monkeys as outgroups. And what that means is we can talk about them as representatives of these things down here. And the outgroups say, yes, they're all hairy, therefore these guys were probably hairy. So the outgroups are hairy, so the common ancestor was probably hairy. This thing was probably hairy. Now what about bilateria? Bilateral things are mirror images like this, the one side to the other. And they look also like this. You can draw a line. So it's like a mirror image. Now, so we divided things into non-bilateral things and bilateral things. And we can easily say that bilateral things on the right evolved from non-bilateral things, which today are those pictures. Here's a phylogenetic tree. And here we are, the vertebra, vertebrata. And here are the bilateral things, and here are the non-bilateral things. And you can see that the non-bilateral things are deeper in the tree. And we want to make the statement, we can make the statement, that most bilaterians are worm-like. So if we look at all these organisms that are listed there and, and show you pictures of them, well, this is what they look like. They all kind of look like there's so many different kinds of worms. Huh? Worms are a very complicated bunch. So what that means is, and if we look at bilateria, and in them we look at, for example, the chordates, and we say, well, we're not worms, are we? And then we look at our ancestors, I know, our cousins, and they're worm-like, worm-like, worm-like. That means we can infer, using outgroups to infer the nature of the common ancestor, we can infer that down here were worm-like things. So we say that bilateria evolved from worm-like ancestors, and bilateria are a kind of worm. Uh, Opisticons, which include fungi and animals. Well, their next group is Apusozoa. They look kind of like amoebas. And then there are other things that look like amoebas. And so using those outgroups to infer the nature of the common ancestor of fungi and animals, we can say that down here, the common ancestors of this whole group are amoeba-like. Apisticons evolved from amoeba-like ancestors, and apisticons are a kind of amoeba. Now, what we've been talking about here are ways to figure out what the common ancestor was like. And we've just discussed outgroups. Basically, we can summarize that as if most outgroups are X, then the common ancestor was probably X. We're not 100% sure, but we put a probably in there. There's another way to talk about an ancestor and to figure out what the ancestors were like by using branch length of a phylogenetic tree. Organisms with the shortest branch lengths from the root are better representatives of the root. So here's an example. Here's a tree of life, and there's the root right in the middle. The things with the shortest branch lengths are here, and you can see how sh short the branch lengths are from the, the twig, the end of the twig where the name is, to the root. Those are the, the shortest ones as opposed to longer ones that are further away from the root. Now, if we look at Aquifex, there's what Aquifex looks like. And so Aquifex is in many ways, because of its short branch length, a better representative of the root than, say, a human being or a corn plant. Now, so that was, there's outgroups, then there's branch length, and then what about fossils? It seems that fossils closest in time to the common ancestor are proxies for the common ancestors. So, for example, we were talking about the common ancestor of chimps and humans that lived about seven million years ago. Well, when you go digging in Africa, you find fossils that are earlier and earlier, and this is the fossil that's the most, 
at the, it's at seven million years or six or seven million years ago, Sahel Chadensis. And so it becomes a proxy for what the common ancestor of chimps and humans might have been like. It doesn't mean it's on our lineage or the chimp lineage or even an ancestor of ours, but it was probably closely related to the ancestor of chimps and humans. Now, so that's outgroups, branch length, fossils. Now this the fourth way is embryology. So larvae, the young forms of organisms, often reveal what the ancestral form was like. Example was the starfish larvae. They display a lateral bisymmetry that's not apparent in the adult starfish. And here is what that looks like. The starfish, is it bilaterally symmetric? Ah, not really. But look at the starfish larvae, and you can see that not only does it have a head, it's also bilaterally symmetric. We can represent our biological identity with the layers of an onion or with an apple tree, like a phylogenetic tree, where the ends of each twig represents a living species on Earth. Here is our twig with a human. And we belong to a larger group called the ape twigs. And the ape twigs belong to an even larger group, a larger circle like the onion of tetrapods. And the tetrapods belong to a larger group called the fish-like creatures, all the creatures that evolved from fish-like organisms. And fish-like organisms evolved from worm-like organisms. And worm-like organisms evolved from amoeba-like organisms. And the amoebas evolved from an even larger group that we call today the eukaryotes. Now, these diverging points are a little bit misleading because they get thicker as they get closer to the trunk. But at each diverging point, there's only one species that is diverging into two. So I guessed at the diverging point, there should only be one species. It only evolves into many, many, many much later. But at the time of the divergence, it's only one species.